representatives of the Federal Aviation Administration. Good morning. This hearing of the Government Activities and Transportation Subcommittee will come to order at this time. We have been joined today by the full committee chairman, Mr. Um, John Conyers of, of Michigan, and I yield at this time to the chairman. Mr. Chairman. I almost thought you said Jack Brooks of Texas. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, Madam Chairman and members of the subcommittee. I want to welcome everyone here today for the important hearings of the Subcommittee on Aviation Security. The uh, hearings today seem to me important because there are two purposes to be served. Uh, the first is to examine whether the Federal Aviation Administration is adequately meeting its responsibility to regulate aviation security in the current era of terrorist atrocities against the large passenger aircraft, the horror of which was illuminated by the bombing of last December. Secondly, how do we prevent weapons and bombs from being placed aboard, abroad, aboard such aircraft, which departs every day in thousands of flights uh, from hundreds of airports through which pass hundreds of thousands of airline passengers? There is no more vulnerable target for this cruel activity uh, than a large aircraft in flight. Uh, the ingenuity and sophisticated technical capability, plus the traveling public's total dependence on air transport, provides the measure of the enormous challenge that faces both the airlines, uh, the airports, and the government regulators as well. Now, it seems from our point of view that the traveling public has a right to have the airports and airlines as safe as possible from terrorist attack. And to do that, the public should be informed about the reasonable and realistic threats against airports and airlines. Uh, so the citizens, should be permitted to make their own informed judgment about whether they think it's safe to fly. And so both the Congress, the public, need to have a thorough understanding of the scope of the problem, the size of the task to meet it, the policies and capabilities and kinds of measures accomplished that are necessary to accomplish this task. Uh, all of us will have to hold a on to a deep appreciation of a basic point. Control of aviation security requires not a measure here or a device there, but a full systems approach, one that preserves its own dynamism to meet the uh, awesome threat that we're confronted with. And it's in that sense that I want to compliment you, Chairwoman Collins, uh, for the thoroughness, the uh, great detail in which you have pursued this investigation that it's now being uh, brought to uh, another important point in its development. You brought a, an excellent array of witnesses forward for today that will provide not only a close examination of the events before and after Lockerbie, but a critical look at measures and devices that, ha that are being introduced largely as a result of that uh, event. And so I think on behalf of all the members of the full committee, uh, we compliment you and look forward uh, to your continued work in this area. There is no question that the shocking and heinous destruction of Pan Am Flight 103 last December was an act of criminal sabotage to profound proportions. While we cannot redeem the lives of the 270 victims, we can vindicate them by doing everything possible to investigate this incident, bring to justice promptly those responsible, and enhance aviation security to help prevent a repetition of this tragic event. Such a commitment to upgrade air security worldwide requires a concerted effort by the Congress, administration, 
and individual air carriers. It requires that we carefully examine all the facts related to security and make informed decisions about developing new security procedures and about how to most effectively expand our resources on security equipment and technologies. Since the tragic bombing of Pan Am 103, this subcommittee has worked diligently to thoroughly investigate this incident and to leave no stone unturned. Over the next two days, we will examine all the facts, issues, concerns, problems, and circumstances which surround the Pan Am incident. In the context of aviation security overall, particularly as it concerns the FAA responsibility, our objective in the next two days is not to assess blame or try to litigate liability issues. That is the proper jurisdiction of the judicial process. Rather, we want to examine closely the FAA's regulatory role as it relates to setting standards, monitoring the airline's security performance, and enforcing violations of those performance standards. We want to focus on those deficiencies in the United States airline security system, which may have allowed the Pan Am bombing to occur. The FAA's role in this regard is particularly significant because it sets the standard for the industry to follow. I have asked the General Accounting Office to provide an analysis of charges made to the Air Carrier Standard Security Program, a program that sets forth security measures to be followed by the U.S. airlines at domestic and foreign airports. Because FAA considers information contained in this program as, as sensitive, the GAO will provide the details of its analysis in our executive session following tomorrow's hearing. However, the GAO has advised me of its general observations which I can share with you. Overall, GF GAO found that despite additional security measures imposed following Pan Am 103, FAA cannot assure itself that required security pr procedures are being properly carried out by the airlines at designated high-risk airports. Security deficiencies found in recent FAA airline security inspections show breakdowns in the training of the airline security screening personnel. GAO believes these deficiencies occur largely because FAA has not established minimum training standards needed to ensure that airline security personnel working at high-risk airports overseas are sufficiently trained to carry out required security measures. The GAO also noted that while the airlines generally provide formal training to security employees, the FAA does not evaluate the adequacy or quality of such training. The FAA will appear to respond to these findings and to describe what initiatives it has taken to upgrade aviation security. Additionally, several expert witnesses who have been critical of the FAA's performance will also present testimony. With respect to Pan Am itself, the subcommittee will take a close look at Pan Am's formation in 1986 of a special security operation called ALERT, which was touted as an elite airline security unit involving the most highly trained security experts and the most sophisticated machines available. In the aftermath of Flight 103, serious doubts have been raised about this claim. Additionally, we will examine a 1986 security report prepared for Pan Am by an Israeli firm which assessed 26 Pan Am stations, including Pan Am Station in London and Frankfurt. The most important conclusions of that report was that Pan Am is highly vulnerable to most forms of terrorist attack. I'm quoting now. The fact that no major disaster has occurred to date, that's at the time of the examination, is merely providential, end quote. We must ask then, to what extent did the problems cited in 1986 exist at the time of the bombing? Just this week, the FAA announced proposed fines against Pan Am for alleged security lapses at Heathrow and Frankfurt. Those alleged violations include one, failure to apply security procedures to identify passengers for further screening, two, improper methods used to check carry-on baggage to passengers identified for additional screening, three, failure to conduct the required search of cargo areas prior to loading cargo. cargo. Pan Am's Director of Security is present to respond, as well as a former Pan Am security official and a member of the Israeli security firm which conducted the 1986 study. So during the course of these hearings, some hard questions have to be asked. Are FAA security standards adequate? Should the American public have had reasonable confidence in December of 1988 that our airline security system was adequate to meet the known terrorist threat 
to U.S. airlines? Can the U.S. public have confidence in the system as modified in the weeks and months since the Pan Am 103 bombing? What security policies and measures should be requested on a long-term basis to meet the known threat? In seeking answers to those and other questions, I encourage the witnesses to be candid and straightforward in their responses. Please be reminded that your oral statements will be limited to the five minutes that we have in the five-minute rule in the House and that your written statements will be made a part of the official record. It is our hope that these hearings will be constructive and result in positive changes. Mr. Nielsen. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and good morning. In my opinion, aviation security is one of the most critical issues of our time. Unfortunately, as often the case, the most critical and sensitive an issue, the more difficult it is to address, particularly the United States, it seems to be the target of choice for most international terrorist organizations. In as open society as ours, very little for what we do, of what we do remains secret for very long. That holds true in the struggle against terrorism. One needs merely to pick up a newspaper or a magazine to learn about the vulnerabilities of the latest explosive detection technology, or even simply to dial up one of the many so-called bulletin boards on a home computer to find out the latest techniques for building a sophisticated homemade bomb. There may even be then individuals in this very room who are hoping to gather information to assist in the planning and execution of the next attack. And uh, there may be others who, for pecuniary or other reasons, personal reasons, are planning to say or reveal things that will inadvertently assist the very actions we seek to prevent. I'm confident the subcommittee will take adequate steps to avoid unnecessary disclosure of sensitive information. The chairwoman has already mentioned we're going to have an executive session on some of those items tomorrow. I trust our witnesses will do the same today. Given the environment in which we must operate and the sophistication and determination of those who commit these reprehensible acts, it's absolutely critical every member of the aviation security team, including the FAA, the airlines themselves, the airports, and Congress, perform our roles and fulfill our responsibilities to the fullest. Unfortunately, U.S. effort against terrorism remains splintered and confused, with too much time and resources wasted on finger-pointing and dodging blame. It is any wonder that American taxpayers and airline passengers continue to question just exactly what are we getting for our security dollar. It's time we commit the necessary cash and personnel to effective security, not just to rhetoric and public relations campaigns. Clearly, the airlines must do more. What can you expect from employees who get paid fast food wages for so important a job as security? It doesn't take much deliberation to choose the minimal risks of burning an occasional hamburger over the burdensome responsibility of deterring terrorists and saving lives. And yet, the level of pay and training for both is about the same. The FAA must do more, particularly in the area of oversight. During the course of our investigation, it became apparent that the airline industry will only do that which is required of them and not much more. In addition, we not only found inconsistent levels of security among airlines, but also within airlines. The situation cries out for more diligent oversight and standardization of training and security procedures. The FAA must become more proactive rather than reactive. To quit worrying so much about avoiding controversy on Capitol Hill and for waiting for Capitol Hill to point the way. I don't think we need an FAA independent of the Department of Transportation near as much as we need an FAA independent of the airlines and also independent of the congressional micromanagement. For our part, Congress must back off a little, give FAA, FAA the room it needs to enable its experts and researchers to do their jobs without having to constantly jump through political hoops or look over their shoulders. We need to stretch our collective attention span to a sustained and consistent level rather than turning it off and on in reaction to the most recent airline tragedy or incident. Because ultimately, Congress determines the degree of effectiveness of aviation security in the U.S. The old adage of the chain being the, as only as strong as the weakest link certainly holds true in aviation security. The time we all pull together, eventually we'll be pulled apart. Madam Chairwoman, I'd like to make one final point, if I may. I want to commend you, commend my good friend, colleague Illinois, for her perseverance and consistency on this issue. She's been subjected to uh, considerable pressure and criticism in practically every quarter, but she's held her ground very well. This has easily been the most thorough and in-depth investigation I have been associated with since joining this subcommittee, and I applaud the chairwoman for giving the staff the time and the resources necessary to conduct as comprehensive investigation as this issue deserves. I look forward to this hearing, and I look forward to a frank and detailed discussion of aviation security, and I thank you, Mr. Madam Chairman.
I think the gentleman from Utah, let me say at this point that uh, much of our investigation could not have gone on without his thorough and complete cooperation, and we certainly as a member of our full committee and as a subcommittee appreciate the work that you have done in this regard, and your staff has certainly been one that can be commended uh, in a very laudatory manner possible for the, their cooperation as well. And uh, I now yield to the gentleman from um, New York, Mr. Owens. Thank you, Madam Chair Leader. I originally not intended to make an opening statement in view of the fact that you have a long list of uh, very knowledgeable and concerned witnesses. However, in order to arrive here and guarantee that I'd be here on time this morning, I decided to take the Pan Am shuttle last night uh, and the example of abuse and misuse of passengers is such that I think it is relevant to this morning's hearing and must be noted. I call the airline to, get, to make certain that I would not be on the last flight. I asked if there was an 8, uh, what was the last flight, and I was told the last flight left at 9.30. I asked if there was an 8.30 flight, and they said yes, there was an 8.30 flight, so that I, in order not to be on the last flight, which by experience I've noted always has some kinds of problems, I tried to get the 8.30 flight. I arrived at the airport at 8 o'clock, and there was a posting that the 8.30 flight would leave at 8.50. The skies were clear in New York. Weather had been beautiful all day. I didn't see any reason for the delay, and we were not told any reason for the delay. However, the 850 flight turned out not to have left, uh, not to have loaded until 9.30. It completed its load at 9.30, which was originally supposed to be the last flight. We sat on the runway for a while and finally took off and uh, never were given an explanation for the delay. Uh, as we approached the city of Washington, uh, we were told that it was too late to land at the National Airport and we'd have to land at Dulles and be transported from Dulles to a National by, by uh, bus. So I, a flight that start, was supposed to have started at 8.30 and arrived in Washington at 9.30 really started out much later and I arrived at the National Airport at 12.20. At 12.20. I could have taken the train and, and gotten here much sooner. No explanations were given. There was no storm in Washington, no bad weather. Uh, and uh, I cite it because it's an example of abuse and misuse of passengers, which I think is important to note in the context of these hearings. The incident reflects certain ingrained habits of dishonesty in dealing with passengers, a blind contempt for the problems generated by manipula manipulation of some bits of information and the withholding of other pieces of information. If we had been told that we were going to Dulles before we left the airport in New York, many passengers would have made uh, plans uh, to have been met and a number of other things could have happened. It was merely a one-hour domestic flight from New York to Washington, but when you amplify that kind of sloppiness and when it continues over a long period of time, and it is a pattern that on the weekend flights get truncated or later flight, earlier flights break down and have to be combined with later flights, uh, it's a pattern and there's a pattern of uh, less experienced personnel and, and less courtesy. A number of things happen on the weekend, I notice, that don't happen at other times. This kind of sloppiness, when it continues over a long period of time, becomes an institutional disease with dangerous consequences. Adherence to the highest standards of service at all times, on domestic as well as international, as well as international flights, will certainly have to be one of the components of the process of assuring greater safety and security on our airlines. I think a hearing of this kind is, is very much in order uh, for its implications for international safety and travel as well as airline uh, travel in general. Thank you very much. Thank you. The gentleman from California, Mr. Cox. Thank you. It's fitting that this subcommittee charged as it is with oversight of FAA's aviation security mission should be conducting this investigation into the adequacy of America's defenses against terrorist attack. We've got to do everything, everything we can, to apprehend terrorists before they succeed in killing innocent travelers. That's why we're here today. But as we enter into this inquiry, let's all keep one thing foremost in mind. The airlines and the traveling public are not the enemy. Terrorists are the enemy. In a recent editorial in the Washington Post, Tom Clancy wrote an article that's headlined, nothing safer for terrorists than killing another American. Nine months after Pan Am 103 disintegrated over Scotland, nothing has been done 
to bring a single terrorist or a single sponsoring state to account. Nobody has yet paid a price. Until we address that side of the terrorist equation, no American will be safe. No amount of hunkering down in America will protect us. No amount of new technology will keep us ahead of terrorists who are bent on killing innocent Americans. We will also hear some testimony during these hearings that suggests that perhaps government should take over airline security by mandating particular technologies, for example, particular, particular explosion detection devices. This may be warranted, but we might also keep in mind that by mandating such nationwide solutions, we may stifle the very technological advances that will protect us in some measure from terrorist attacks. Thank you. Our first panel today will consist of the following. Oh, I'm sorry. Ms. Boxer, the lady from California, Ms. Boxer. Maybe you didn't recognize me with my new hair. <laughs> That's exactly what happened. Uh, <laughs> I'm delighted that you're, you're back in form, and uh, I'm very happy that you're feeling well and that you're back in form and that we're here today on this urgent issue. Very briefly, I have just a couple of comments to make. I don't think I'll ever forget, nor will anyone else, the, the look on the parents' faces as they were waiting for those children to come off that plane. Uh, and uh, as a parent myself, and having been in that circumstance where I was waiting for kids to come home, um, I really won't ever forget it. And I'm very pleased that you are having this in-depth investigation. I'd like to agree with my colleague from California that the enemy of the terrorists, but I would also like to point out that there are other countries who live with terrorism day after day in a much worse circumstance than we are, and they seem to do better. They seem to do better with airline safety. So I think that today, uh, with the very questions you have posed, we ought to be able to do better in the future, and I commend you for these hearings. Thank the gentlelady. Now, and I apologize, I uh, really thought you were just talking to, um, you were someone else. Well, I was talking to And you were just talking to uh, <laughs> Owen. Our first, um, <laughs> our first panel will consist of Mr. Ed Cunningham, who's the Director of Security for Pan Am, Mr. Isaac Yeffett, who's the Security Consultant on the 1986 Pan Am KPI report, Mr. Fred Ford, who's a former Pan Am Security Director, and Mr. Noel Cox, who is the um, Security Consultant. Won't you come forward, please, gentlemen? Is it Cook? Okay. Some pronounce it Cook. Want to swear in a little bit? Want to swear in there? It's Cook. Like C O O K. Okay. I sure will. As I had mentioned uh, earlier, gentlemen, uh, the House operates under a five-minute rule. Your full testimonies will become a part of the record, and therefore we're going to limit your, um, your, your discussion at this time to whoever you want to talk about uh, for five minutes only. And we have a time clock up in here, and uh, we're going to use it. I'd like for you to stand, please. Witnesses, we're going to swear you in this morning. Raise your right hands. You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Thank you. Why don't we begin with you, Mr. Cunningham? Good morning, Madam Chairman. Good morning. I would just like to say one or two words from my prepared statement, which, of course, you will include in the record, and from the comments I've heard from the members this morning. Uh, and I think the gist of what should come out of our hearings um, is that airline security, this very, very important subject, uh, is not a one person or one group responsibility. I think it's very, very important that it be shared by both the carriers, who, of course, have a tremendous responsibility in that area, 
and as the rest of the nations around the world do, uh, by the governments uh, who also have a tremendous responsibility. We certainly in the carriers recognize uh, our responsibility, but unlike a maintenance issue or an operations issue, we're not equipped to do this all by ourselves, and we very definitely need the help of the government uh, in this important undertaking. Thank you. Mr. Yefit. Madam Chairwoman, members of the subcommittee. Will you move the me. microphone closer to you, please? Allow me to express my appreciation for inviting me to appear before you to talk about the U.S. security aviation. I was many years, most of my life, in the field of the security in different subjects, including I have been six years the head of security of El Al, the Israeli National Airlines. 1986, I was part of team that were hired by Pan Am to do a security survey in Europe and in the United States. At the end of 86, we gave Pan Am our report that included findings and recommendations. 1989, I was hired by three different companies to do a security survey inside the United States. I was hired by Life Magazine, uh, News 4, TV in Washington, and other company in uh, Chicago. What I found in our security survey, 1986 and 1989, I must say that I didn't see any changes that could be good. I have the impression that the security airlines of America are running their security in a way like nothing happened in the past and nothing will happen in the future. The American government cannot allow facing every year a new tragedy. 1986, February 86, TWA 840, Rome, Athens. Explosive exploded, people were killed and injured. Summer 86, Pan Am Karachi, when the aircraft was attacked on ground by terrorists, people were killed and injured. 1987, December 7th, flight PSA 1771, 43 people were killed. 1988, Pan Am 103, we know that results of 270 people that were killed. The American Carriers are running their security and they are following the FAA procedures. While the FAA told the airlines that they are responsible, each airline, for his own security, the result that the airline decided to give a low priority to the security and they are signing contracts with the cheapest private security company. The results of this contract, the cheapest the private security companies are hiring a low level of personnel by paying them 335, 360, and four dollars per hour. They train them eight to ten hours, and I was told that also less than eight and ten hours. Allow me to give a few examples. In Denver, we were interviewing a security man who was in charge running an X-ray uh, machine on international flight. He told us that he was trained eight hours before he became in charge of running the X-ray machine on this international flight. 
he said also that he is looking for the green color which means metal and the dark color normally it might be books when we ask him if you see something more suspicious then what you have to do his answer was I was instructed to ask the owner of the luggage what he has inside the luggage whatever he tells me I have to believe him and to release the luggage and to, to send it to the aircraft security check background why we have to check only last five years of everybody who is coming to be as a security man the FAA that is sending the procedures to the airlines must follow how they implement the procedures or they ignore the procedures. If the FAA would check how the security of PSA at LA were running their security, they would find that they ignored the FAA procedures and PSA 1771 happened because of the bad security system. I believe that America must force the airlines to build a good security system by law it's not enough to find ten thousand dollars the airlines when they fail on test airline that have budget of billions of dollars the ten thousand won't shake them but if they will know that they will violate the law and they will be brought to the court and they might lose the rights to land on the station where they made the violation, they will understand that they have to run their security by thinking about the life of innocent people that are, that are traveling with them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Ford. Chairman Conyers, Chairwoman Collins, members of the subcommittee, it is an honor and a privilege to appear before you today to submit testimony on a matter of great importance. It is important not only to those families who lost loved ones in the tragic bombing of Pan Am 103, but to those who may travel today or in the future on airlines carrying the flag of the United States of America. I did not come here today to debate the responsibility of the fate of Pan Am 103, but to comment on a segment of the transportation industry that is in transition. I hope that we do not need another Pan Am 103 to learn a lesson that should already be in the textbooks of airlines and those who regulate them. Pan Am 103 was not skyjacked. The Pan Am 103 tragedy must force us to reevaluate our position and to my thinking not a minute too soon. There are many questions to be answered. Is a private sector owned airliner aircraft entitled to less protection than U.S. military aircraft when they both carry the flag of our country. Part 107 of the Federal Aviation Regulations adequately deal with the threat of hijacking. Passengers routinely reach for their keys and coins when approaching a security checkpoint, just as Israeli children reach under their seats on a school bus to check for explosives. Awareness has become second nature. It has become as routine as stopping at a railroad crossing and frequent travelers will adjust to most new procedures promulgated to increase the survivability of a journey by air. 
The airline security function was initially created to counteract internal acts of fraud, ticket theft, cargo security, and the like. Hijacking was a new wrinkle in the early 70s, and it took the federal government to act to create industry standards for both airlines and airports. This is no different in evolution than the industry is going through today in the matter of aging aircraft, a new problem created by the fact that we have a fleet of older aircraft. But that was not in the public eye until the Aloha 737 and the United 747 incidents. Does Part 107 need to be reevaluated? Should U.S. flag airlines be left to design their own system of protection? Was Pan Am 103 a fluke that may never reoccur? Can we afford to make that assumption? Will the actions of our government in the Middle East provoke further terrorist attacks against U.S. flag carriers? Are airlines natural targets because they are defenseless and create a public arena for revolutionaries of various factions? I cannot answer these questions and doubt that this committee today could rationalize these discussions to the satisfaction of all concerned. We could, however, make an assumption as to the probability of Pan Am 103 being repeated, and let us assume that it will. Does compliance with Part 107 relieve all from responsibility? Is saying we were in compliance, what more could we have done, absolve any of us from the responsibility of providing safe air travel? While these aircraft are owned by private industry, they do carry our American flag. Their routes are awarded by international treaty and regulated by intergovernmental agreements. Many international airlines are owned by their governments and considered representatives of their country. Pan Am certainly bears the burden of being the carrier of the American flag. Assuming this to be true, do our aircraft require any less protection than Kuwaiti oil tankers traversing the Straits of Hormuz? Is oil more precious than human life? We have asked these same questions and responded using different commodities. I suggest our family and loved ones are entitled to at least the same concern and level of safety as oil from Kuwait. In closing, I must submit to this distinguished panel and its observers that I am hesitant to comment publicly on this subject, but from a personal viewpoint, I am most concerned. I have personally observed those who play the odds in terrorism. I respect their respect for the enemy. I'm seated by one today. They are not people seen only in James Bond movies. The perpetrators are real. The families of the passengers of Pan Am 103 know they exist. We were warned and chose not to act because Part 107 was the insurance policy. The insurance policy is reasonably valid if the violator comes to the front door of the aircraft. If the violator chooses to enter through the cargo door, the catering truck, or the maintenance vehicle, then the policy is no longer in effect and we have no further obligations. I think it is time that we review the contents of our insurance policy. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Cook? Thank you, uh, Madam Chairwoman. I think one can't say that it, uh, one welcomes the opportunity to be present on, on such an occasion. Uh, we'd rather that uh, that were not necessary. The hijacking and the bombing of civil aircraft is not new. What is new that these acts are carried out for political purposes supported by nations that can bring resources and a great deal of sophistication to the work. These are acts of war for the 21st century, and our response to the problem is rooted in the civil doctrines of the 20th century. People are making war on our country by attacking our civil air assets, and we're responding by asking the victims of the fight to defend themselves. One result is that aviation security is not taken very seriously any more than most other types of industrial security are taken seriously by the upper management level. Security is overhead and the money managers want as little of it as they can possibly get. They hire on the basis of no discernible set of requirements. There seems to be a working consensus that if you were a policeman or a military man, the FBI or the Secret Service, you must know how to deal with things like terrorism and no director of security will ever admit that he doesn't know or have the means at his disposal to deal with a problem like terrorism. This becomes a manhood issue. So we end up with security departments filled with unqualified retirees at the top and entry level minimum wage workers who are not properly trained at the bottom. Another result is that to the extent security is taken into account, it is as a marketing device. 
it is to bring it to the point much easier to understand Pan Am's system, the alert system, as a marketing program than as a security program. When the inevitable consequences of these attitudes befall us, we dash about looking for some magic to uh, deal with the problem. Special techniques, special experience, special technology, special this, special that. Madam Chairwoman, we have to see our national aviation system as a national asset and defend it accordingly by insisting that our allies observe the existing protocols providing sanctions against countries associated with acts, hostile acts against civil aviation, that we must exert our own unilateral sanctions where necessary and where that's possible, that we have to certify and regulate those who are involved with aviation security from the screeners at the bottom to the gurus at the top, and we have to take the same far-sighted and systematic approach to this problem as we would take to any other major matter affecting our national security, our national interest, and our economic future. Each of the components in this system, the carriers, the air terminal operators who have not been mentioned yet, and the federal government has a part to play, I think we need a better distribution and a redistribution of the burden of labor that associates itself with this problem. I want to touch on one matter because it's, uh, it comes up again and again, and this is the role of FAA, and if I have uh, time left in my five minutes, I want to recall that, uh, that the division of labor within the federal executive, the executive branch of the federal government assigns to all acts of terrorism uh, a responsibility to the, uh, to the State Department. They are the lead agency under the concept that we work when we deal with these problems. With the exception of aviation security, and that falls in the lap of the FAA. So we have a major cabinet agency responsible for most forms of terrorism, and we have a, a very small, essentially regulatory agency having to take responsibility for probably the single largest problem we have in the area of terrorism. It seems to me there's a disproportionate assignment of responsibility. You can uh, assume that the assignment of, uh, of uh, resources to deal with that responsibility are roughly equal and it's not sufficient to the uh, problem that we face. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, my five minutes up already? Uh, first of all, I thank uh, all of the witnesses for their statements. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, two questions. The first I'm going to ask uh, security consultant Isaac Yefet about his report in 1986 to summarize its key points. And uh, then, of course, I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Cunningham uh, what happened in terms of uh, the uh, failure to implement or the implementation as it may have occurred. So you may divide this time accordingly. Mr. Yeffert, what, what, uh, what was in your report and uh, what, is it, what, is it, what did it tell us? Allow me, sir, to ask the Madam Chairwoman and members of subcommittee to discuss this subject while we have to go in detail to in a closed session because the report was over 260 pages with the findings and our recommendations. And I believe that this kind of subject should be discussed in a closed session. Well, I, I, I want to talk about it in a closed session tomorrow, but you were the one that uh that brought up the fact that there were uh, that there were some uh, proposed changes that ought to be made. For example, adequate training. Uh, well, let me just trace. There are many ways to skin a cat. Okay. All right. So let me just trace what you said uh, here. Uh, I believe you said there was uh, inadequate training procedures, and that the people themselves were probably. Uh, 
relatively unskilled, and they were undercompensated. Is that correct? Well, can you amplify on, on that? When we are talking about training security people, first, we cannot hire unqualified people for $335 or $360 per hour. Nobody can hire a qualified security people to run the security of the airline. While we know that in the hands of the security people, we leave a life of thousands of passengers. The problem that the security people are coming to work, not because they are looking at this job as a career or a permanent job, while they was unemployed and they were looking for job, they came to the security, they remained a couple of months, and they left. I was talking while I was doing the security survey for News 4 in Washington. I spoke with a supervisor at National Airport, and I asked her, how can I be hired as a security man? And she told me that I have to fill a form and to write what I did only in my last, my, my last five years. And if they will find that the last five years I wasn't criminal, they will call me, I'll be sit in a class to watch how hand grenade, revolver, pine bob, a dynamite, dynamite is looking like, and from there they will take me for another two hours to see how to run x-ray machine. And immediately after that, I will be in charge to run the x-ray machine and other job that they will tell me to do. And in my hands, thousands of life of innocent people, mm -hmm. they, they put in, uh, in, in my hands. When I asked her, you see how is my age? I'm not 25 years old or 25 years old. And she said, this is not important. We are following the FAA procedures only the last five years. When we asked her, how can I be sure that I'll be hired? She told us, to the reporter and myself, that I have nothing to worry. She can assure me that I'll be hired because they have problems with the security people that they are hiring. They remain in their position till the day they find another job with a better salary and they leave. Nobody told me once that he is looking at the security of when he works for the airline security, that he is doing some mission some holy thing, that he is looking at the job as a permanent job. Of course, that's not the uh, employee's fault. Uh, we've got uh, some massive unemployment in this country, and people get jobs wherever they can. What about the, uh, the requirements in the Federal Aviation Administration on the airline? And what about the airline itself in terms of the regulations and the kind of and quality of personnel that they're supposed to recruit? The FAA, they know much better than I do what are the level, the low level of security that the airlines are hiring. And they told the airlines that they know that they are looking to sign a contract with the cheapest private security company. Why the FAA didn't force the airlines to change this concept, this attitude, I cannot answer, sir. But also, the FAA know, as I know, that owners of restaurants started to bid to get contract 
with the airlines and they went to security people at airports by trying to convince them if they will work for them, they will add to their salary food from their restaurant. When at Dallas Airport, private security company failed almost third of the tests that have made by the FAA, almost seven times from 21 times they failed in their test, they decided to fire the company. And what happened? I have learned, and I hope that I'm not wrong from the information that I received. A new security, private security company was hired. They just changed the uniform of the security people, and the same people that failed in their test are continuing to running the security, sir. They may be working there right now. It's now, possible. To, to what extent did Pan Am comply with the report that you filed uh, in 1986? I will appreciate, sir, if we can leave the discussion about our report to Pan Am to the closed session. All right. Well, let me ask Mr. Cunningham, the Director of Security presently, for a response to the comments that he's heard. Yes, thank you, Mr. Conyers. I think Mr. Yefford is saying two things there, and I'm not sure he realizes exactly what he's saying. But first of all, I think he's very much supporting what you're hearing from everybody else, uh, that, that airline security needs some help from the government and it needs some very much direct involvement in it needs more than just regulation oversight, it needs some active assistance. But what I also think he's, he's missing is, is he's missing the basic fundamentals of our American system when he's trying to impose the El Al system one for one or the Israeli system one for one on U.S. carriers. And I don't think that works. For example, he talks about five-year background checks. Is why is that all we do? Well, one of the problems we have doing a background check is, of course, we run into Privacy Act issues. We're not going to get a tremendous amount of information uh, from the state or federal government. Uh, as, all we're going to get is an arrest check. We're not going to get a uh, conviction check, rather. We're not going to get arrests. We're not going to get information from terrorist files. And that's a difference between the system that, uh, that he's speaking of in Israel. The second level he's speaking of is the awareness. And that very definitely is true here. You know, as, as somebody said, when an Israeli child gets on a bus, they reach under the seat to see if there's a bomb there. We don't do that anywhere in the United States. I think if anybody rode the bus or the metro this morning and you reached under the seat, you were looking to see if your briefcase was still there. You certainly weren't looking for a bomb. That level of awareness is not present throughout our society in the United States today. Uh, and I think that's a big fundamental difference uh, in what uh, Mr. Yefford uh, is, is dealing with. Well, let me just suggest to you that the Privacy Act is a, uh, a law that deals with the release of individuals of information voluntarily. It has nothing to do with the, uh, a background check of, in, in this kind of case. A government, in, a government check doesn't go back five years unless you specify more. An FBI a, a background on any citizen covers his entire lifetime. There's no f statute of limitations on uh, how far back you go. We don't have access to that, Mr. Kanye. That was my point. Well, the FAA does. And, and you could, too, if you wanted to. I mean, all you have to do is uh, ask the person that's applying in the application to uh, OK a background check. For, for all kinds of uh, work, uh, that's a standard requirement. Now, let me uh, allow Mr. Yefford uh, to make a comment. Mr. Cunningham said that, in my words, maybe it's unrealistic to build a security system like El Al. Allow me to emphasize. America is a big target for the terrorism. 
and Israel is a big target for the terrorism. It's true that El Al is small airline. That's a question that should be asked, Madam Chairwoman. They very few millions of passengers that they are flying with the small El Al Airlines. Do they have the right to fly safe and to be secured? And the many millions of Americans that they are flying with a big American Airlines, they don't have the same right to survive, to be safe, and to be secured? What happened two years ago? And a big American airline decided to start running their security, similar to El Al. They changed the unrealistic to realistic. The fact that we are calling America to see Pan Am 103, the last tragedy of this country. And it's in our hands to build a good security system. The fact that many millions American are flying with big American airlines, when we ask that they have the same rights to fly safe and to be secured like El Al, this is not realistic. This is a make, makes any difference between El Al and the American carrier. Are we looking only to react and to be always behind the tragedies and then to ask ourselves what happened, why this happened, what we should do now that this won't happen again? Sir, what the FAA, I just read in newspaper that they made inspection at Pan Am in Frankfurt three times this year. And they are looking to find them a couple of millions of dollars because the lack of the security that they found. I believe that the same results that they came to after having the inspection, they could see it. 1986, 1987, 1988, and we could might save life of the passengers. The same I can say about PSA 1771 from December 7th, 87. If one of the FAA inspectors that went to test the security people of PSA at Los Angeles, and if he would talk to the people to understand what kind of level of security people are running the security there, what they have learned, how they implement the procedures, they would find that nothing was implementing. We cannot allow ourselves only to react. After 103, I'm listening what kind of effort and pressure is putting to buy the TNA. Is the TNA really will solve our problem of the security of the airlines? When I have learned that two and a half plastic explosive, two and a half pounds, cannot be identified through, through the TNA, are we ready to invest millions of dollars when everyone knows that less than two pounds of Centex, which is the plastic explosive, 
will be more than enough to blow up 747? I don't believe that we are not making mistakes in this country by putting all our trust and faith on equipment, on machine only. Mr. Yefet, if I may, one of the things we're going to be discussing tomorrow in the uh, executive session is some of the technologies that uh, are available and potential technologies that are available. And perhaps the TNA will be one of those that we'll discuss, and we aren't going to discuss uh, it in detail at this particular time. I would like also to move on to uh, the, my questions, and I'd like to start with you, Mr. Cunningham. Uh, were you at um, Pan Am in, uh, in 1986? No, Madam Chairman, I was not. Okay. Uh, do you happen to know um, uh, about the Operation Alert? I know some limited information about it, yes. Okay. It was uh, described, I've been described that it was, I've told that it was described as a, uh, something that Pan Am advertised as being the most secure airline in the United States, the world, or something like that, and of all the air carriers from the United States, and all of those kinds of things. Uh, when did you come to Pan Am? I came to Pan Am in August of last year, of 1988. August of last year. What kind of security measures uh, that you can talk about now were in place at that time? Well, Pan Am had alert functioning in several of its cities, uh, both in the U.S. Uh, and Europe. Uh, Pan Am complied with the FAA requirements uh, throughout our system. Uh, I think the alert was an effort uh, to remedy some of the problems that Mr. Yeffert may have talked about uh, and may have found in 1986 and in a level to raise the awareness and to raise the level of security. Yes, I, I believe that. Okay, was that to uh, raise the level of security within Pan Am or for the passengers to uh, have the image that Pan Am was safer than perhaps some other U.S. carrier? No, I think it was a genuine attempt to, uh, to raise the level of security, the effectiveness of the level of security. Can you uh, tell us um, at this time, I know that you will be back tomorrow for executive session, can you describe to us at all today uh, Pan Am security operations at the time of the December 21st, 1988 bombing when you were a member of uh, the Pan Am staff? I think maybe that's something we should do in a, in a closed session. Though. Can you tell us any changes that you have made since then? Uh, yes, but again, I think we, can, we should do that in a closed session. There have been some changes, and of course we believe that security can't be a static system. It has to be one continually uh, upgrading and a program to stay ahead rather than look back, as Mr. Yefford said, no question about it. And so how do you do that? Are you taking some uh, monthly analyses of, uh, of situations as they, as they develop, or, or is this just a one-time shot in the arm and then you aren't going to do anything else until perhaps another tragedy occurs? No, we're continuing reviewing our security across our system. We have people who go out and, and look at it on a monthly or quarterly basis, depending on what the situation is. We have people reviewing it regularly, uh, and we are attempting to put in systems that will prevent another incident, as opposed to looking back on one saying what we can do. The um, um, 1986 study that was done by uh, KPI seemed to um, have indicated that Pan Am security was somewhat lax. In fact, the findings were, I think, uh, pretty damaging. Could you comment generally on Pan Am's response to those findings, Mr. Ford? I'd like to preface my remarks by saying, uh, from a personal standpoint, from a professional standpoint, this is much more than a Pan Am issue. And I understand why Pan Am is the focus uh, here today, but I would uh, respectfully request that my remarks be interpreted uh, from an industry standpoint as opposed to one of looking to find fault on Pan Am 103. If you will recall, my opening remarks were that we weren't trying to find fault or assess blame. We're trying to, to discuss a situation of security for all our flying public, not just for Pan Am, for every other uh, I understand that. and all I'm the just rest. just looking to confirm it. So your, um, your, um, your comments are well taken. I think in uh, 1986, and I go back to May, I believe it was May 5th of 1986, I met with the chairman and vice chairman of Pan Am regarding the formation of ALERT, and I walked away from that meeting believing, uh, as I think both those gentlemen did too, that this was a, an undertaking of the utmost priority. Uh, certainly uh, a, s a strong seriousness of purpose, and it was our intent at that particular time to establish 
a security system both domestically and internationally that would be uh, the model of the industry. And in fact, it hopefully would be so strong that other airlines and people engaged in public transportation would contract with us to help them implement the same level of security. What were the, uh, the differing views at Pan Am regarding those approaches to uh, security? Excuse me, Madam Chair. I what were the views at Pan Am about the various approaches you had uh, that were made by Pan Am to some of the suggestions that were made through the alert program and others? Well, I think there were uh, two distinctly different uh, schools of thought, not unlike you'd have in any other industry uh, on marketing issues and so forth. One was the traditional security viewpoint, which was if you are in compliance with Part 107, then what you have uh, is adequate. And the other school of thought was that Part 107 was no longer adequate uh, in terms of the terroristic threat and that the level of security had to be greatly enhanced and it had to be greatly enhanced in a very short period of time. The uh, I was in the latter school, and uh, the director of security at that time was in the former school. Which, which, which view prevailed at that time? I think in the early stages of ALERT, uh, the more aggressive approach of developing a uh, first class, uh, very effective uh, security system uh, was the overriding objective. Uh, KPI, um, uh, in the KPI arrangement that, uh, that they had with uh, Pan Am, they called for a phase two uh, during which certain recommendations were to be implemented. Do you know whether or not those recommendations ever were implemented? No, I do not. I uh, left that particular program, I believe, in August of 86. My time has expired. Mr. Uh, Nielsen. At the outset, Madam Chairman, I have about uh, 50 questions I'd like to ask, and I don't have time for that many, so I'd like to submit some in writing. Let me go with you, Mr. Cunningham, first of all. Um, how does ALERT fit into Pan Am's corporate structure, and to whom does Mr. LeBlanc report? Uh, ALERT is a subsidiary of Pan Am Corporation today, uh, and Mr. LeBlanc, who is the president of ALERT, reports to uh, Mr. John Lindsay, who is the senior vice president and general counsel of Pan Am. What kind of background checks the foreign nationals that you hire on the alert program? Do you make, it, do you make any background checks of uh, personnel in general and foreign nationals in particular? Yes, of course, in the United States and in every place we will do what we can with the minimum five-year background uh, requirement and go beyond that if that's possible. Uh, in foreign um, countries, it really depends on what the law of that country permits us to do. Uh, some of them are very restrictive, some of them the government has to do the complete background for us, and, and some of them we can do virtually nothing. Uh, what's the average turnover rate of your personnel in the ALERT program? I, I don't know, Mr. Nielsen, but I'd be happy to get that information. What's the average hourly wage, for the starting point, starting in London, Frankfurt, for example? It was alleged earlier in a statement that, uh, by, both by myself and by one, el one other person, that the wages are very, very nearly minimum wage. Uh, do you have any evidence on that? I, I can speak to Frankfurt. It's the only one I can tell you off the top of my head. And I know Frankfurt, our wage is, uh, is the same as uh, other American carriers there, which I'm sure is above the minimum wage. Okay. I have a question to Mr. Yeffert. I appreciate your, con uh, your testimony. One part of your statement which you did not read, you said that we have a open invitation for terrorism because we use curbside checking. We check the bags at the curb and then we don't necessarily accompany those bags onto the aircraft. How does that differ from checking the bags in at the counter? We don't necessarily go to the airplane after we check at the counter either, do we? Today, at every airport in the country, everyone can go to the curbside of the terminal, giving the sky cap luggage, package, whatever he wants, telling him, please send this luggage to this flight number, this destination, and the luggage will be straight uh, going to the belly of the aircraft without doesn't, any doesn't security check. Do that from the ticket check-in, uh, baggage check-in at the ticket also? 
uh, they do the same. There is no any kind of security check of any luggage that uh, is going to the belly of passenger aircraft on domestic flights. Now, when I was and the worst, excuse me, and the worst is that while I was doing the security survey for News 4 in Washington, we went to National Airport and we were surprised to see that people took their luggage and they themselves place luggage on the conveyor belt that leads to the baggage room and from there to the uh, aircraft. Even the skycap didn't have to do it. And they shot pictures while we were doing our security survey. Now in Amsterdam, when I was flying there a year or so ago, they had us check the luggage normally and then that luggage was sitting out in front of the aircraft, we had to identify the luggage that went on as we went on. Do you think that would solve the problem? I think that the system in Amsterdam, while I'm familiar with this system, no passenger can send his luggage without searching him by opening the luggage. Now, they didn't open the luggage, but what they did is they checked it, and then they had the bags there, and then only those bags which we would recognize as our bags went on the plane. And there were several of that bags left there because the passengers who had to check those bags did not go on the plane. Do you, do you think that would help at all? No, uh, I saw how they searched luggage. If they didn't search the luggage, the fact that they uh, brought the luggage in front of the aircraft and every passenger has to identify his luggage this didn't solve the problem of the security. But at least it does mean that no one's going to take luggage on unless he's going on himself. Uh, in other words, you don't have any unidentified or unaccompanied luggage. Not only to identify, sir. Uh, we know that... Well, that's all I want to know, is if you think that would be a, a no, step with coming... Okay. because not, not only uh, terrorists are sending explosive and flying with the aircraft they are ready to be suicide. We know how innocent people or criminals that they are believing that they are smuggling drugs yeah, and they don't know that they have You're explosives. It doesn't go far enough, but don't you think it would be helpful no. to at least make sure that the bag goes on, the play, the, it does not, no bag goes on unless the guy is willing to fly with the bag? Minimum. That, this is the minimum. Okay. Well, it's a lot more than we do in this country. Okay, let me ask, another, and let me say, relate also. I flew to, Pan uh, to London on a Pan Am flight just recently, and then from London on to the uh, United States. They took the luggage off at London. We had to go through it three more times. I thought Pan Am leaned over backwards to check it many, many times. In London, even though it had been checked at the, at the beginning point going to London, and then was going to go on by another Pan Am plane on to uh, New York, and I felt that they overdid it almost. And, uh, a lot of the passengers were grousing and complaining, look, we've done that three times, et cetera, et cetera. I was one of, among that group. How do we change our attitude, my, including mine, that, that, that maybe we should do that, we should be willing to? By simple having a system that the security people will know, will be trained well, and to understand how to run the security without doing nothing that it won't be helpful for the passenger, or for the airline, or for the security. Is my time um, yes, it has. I, I assume we'll have another round at sure least. Will. Thank you. I have some questions, Mr. Cook. Mrs. Boxer. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Mr. Cunningham, you're in charge of Pan Am security and were the day of the crash. And yet, when you had a chance to summarize your statement, I was very disappointed and rather shocked that you said about two dozen words to us, which essentially were boiled down to, we can't do any more, the government has to do it. In your written statement, and I'm quoting it, you say, private air carriers alone are ill-equipped and ill-suited to the task of combating international terrorism. So I'm assuming that you think it's government's responsibility, and my question to you is, what should we do right now? What's the first thing this panel should recommend uh, to our colleagues that the government do? 
Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to leave you with the impression that, that I'm saying that it's only government's responsibility. Certainly that's not true. Well, I, what is the first thing government can do to help? I, I think the government uh, can provide us with a system, for example, the FAA can provide us with a system uh, which will work with us as partners. I don't think the FAA has all the answers. I don't think the government has all the answers. And I don't do think we have all the I'm, answers. I'm, I'm having to interrupt because of my time limitations. What do you mean by a system? I think the government has more of a responsibility to us than merely being a regulator looking at us and saying, we put the rules in and you must follow them. Well, what do you want us to I do? I think what they have to do is to help us to follow the rules, right? They have to provide us with some intelligence. They have to provide us with some assistance in training. They have to provide us with some assistance. One of the big keys in the LL system, why it works so well, is that it's, it's a government manned and it's a government funded system. Okay, so you would like to see a government funded system to help you carry out a plan that is developed jointly with the airlines, the airports, and the government. Okay. Um, right now you have a security system in place. What percentage of your gross receipts do you spend on that security system? I, I, I don't know, but if you'd like, I'd get some. I would like to know in. that. Um, also, Mr. Yeffert said, yes, I'll be happy to you. I'm sorry. We'd like We'd like to have that information um, within the next week so that we can uh, get our, our uh, report and hearing on. Well, as a security officer, maybe I'd follow up on my question. You certainly must have some notion of what percentage you ought to spend on security, do you not? That you recommend to your carrier? A percentage of our gross receipts to be spent? No, I, I don't think. You just design a system and say with the money that you need. We design the system and, and submit okay. the budget, yes. Okay. Um, Mr. Yeffet, I, I was very taken by your, uh, your testimony, very strong, and I think that you have the credentials. Um, you stated that you did not believe that Pan Am made any changes after your report. Is that correct? Any changes of note in their security system? No. What I said that first I would like to discuss some details this subject in a closed session. Number two, I said, what the FAA found during their inspection this year in Frankfurt, I said that I believe that they could find the same results 1986, 7, and 8. Okay. I didn't go on details. But okay. allow me to add to your question to Mr. Cunningham. To throw the ball from one group to the government, this is the easiest way. If the airlines would run their security as the FAA even told them, and I'm not going now to talk what is good, what is bad, but if the airlines did the minimum to implement the FAA regulations or procedures, I have no doubt that we would have a better security. If the airlines would put the right priority of the security in the right level, we wouldn't have what we have today I understand at the you. airports. I understand your point. You don't think the American Airlines are doing enough. Now, I want to make, ask you to comment on uh, Mr. Cunningham's written statement in which he says, and I, I really am interested in your reaction, that any perception that foreign carriers are more secure than U.S. carriers is illusory, and he goes on to say that U.S. carriers are required to implement rigorous security measures. Most foreign carriers have far fewer screening procedures than U.S. carriers. He says American citizens are, as a result, placed in jeopardy when they travel on these foreign airlines. Is that your opinion, that the foreign airlines are less safe than the American airlines? Do you agree with Mr. Cunningham? No, I disagree. And I don't think that he's right when he's uh, saying this kind of statement because where is our security in this country 
that when we compare it to a, a other foreigner air carriers, where is the good security system that we can put our finger and say, here we are better than the other carriers? Let's check ourselves to make sure that we built our system even 30%, 40%, or 20% to prevent disasters. And then to go and to look to the other foreigner carriers and to compare it. It's good to compare, to see if I am better or I am worse and what I can learn from other carriers that I can implement in my airline. But just to testify by saying that we are better than others, I think it's a mistake and we have to be careful by using this kind of words when we know what kind of security we have in our country. Madam Chair, I think Mr. Cunningham, I, I will hold off till the next round, but I think Mr. Cunningham would like to defend his uh, statement, if that's all right with you. Thank you. I really appreciate that. I, I know the strict rules here. I, I think some of, some, of the, some of the point is being missed here on what I said. I, I said certainly that I think that no foreign, non-U.S. flag carrier does some of the things that U.S flag carriers do. For example, uh, Mr. Nielsen, some of the things that you spoke of in London, I, I certainly don't think you're going to see that on a foreign carrier. But I, I'm certainly not saying that we're living with the system we have today and that we're not going to learn from what some other people do. Uh, unquestionably we do. And as I've said several times, airline security can't be a static system. It's got to be a dynamic one. What we have today that may work for, for today, September 25th, may not work on October 1st. And we certainly have to be looking at those things and have to be moving forward. But I think that no non-US flag carrier complies certainly with the FAA requirements. They're not required to do that. And I don't think any of them go beyond the security you see on American carriers any place today. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Um Mr. Uh, Ford, um, and I'm going to get off of this in a few. Oh, I'm so sorry. Mr. Cox. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Mr. Cook, I think that your years of experience as Director of Special Planning at the Pentagon can be of great value to us, and I want to compliment you on your testimony, which I think was right on the mark. In your testimony, uh, you said that our intelligence services are not sharing information even among themselves properly, let alone uh, with private airline carriers, and you recommend that FAA develop its own intelligence capability. I wonder if you could expand on that. Yes, sir, I think that uh, it, it's a simple fact of the of bureaucratic competition and turf protection and turf building that your intelligence services don't share information as, uh, as well as we would like them to do. Um, in addition to that point is the fact that uh, there are certain kinds of aviation, uh, certain intelligence that relates to aviation that is unique and specific. And that our uh, existing services don't pursue these kinds of intelligence. We think that we need a separate capability that develops uh, what are called essential elements of information that can be pursued within the framework of an institution that has specific understanding and specific responsibility for uh, aviation itself. I think that uh, the difficulty of doing that, and might I say also that a great deal of information that's useful to you is in the, uh, is in the public domain. It's open source information. It's a question of how to analyze it and how to deal with it. Uh, we're not presently doing that and I think that uh, we need to do it. You've also noted that the air terminal itself uh, ought to be a better security perimeter than presently it is. Uh, in fact, you compared it to a sort of giant car wash where we ought to think of uh, everything coming out of the terminal as clean if we can possibly attain that goal. 
what might we do at terminals that we're not doing presently? If I could step back from the terminal, uh, Mr. Cox, the, this problem begins back with the assessment of the threat that you're dealing with. And then it, be, it runs through ticket acquisition so that by the time you get to, uh, to the, uh, the air terminal uh, perimeter itself, you ought to have begun to, to cull out some of the threat universe that you're dealing with. If we're going to wait until we get to plane side before we worry about uh, getting rid of a security threat, we're not going to do it. So and am I the, right, excuse me, am I right that that would require the carriers to have much more intelligence information than presently they do have? That's correct. That's correct. They need it. Uh, as far as the, the terminal itself is concerned, uh, our terminals right now are, uh, are, are great shopping malls. Uh, they're extremely vulnerable to penetration. Uh, it's possible to put the equipment on an aircraft through the, uh, the vendor system, uh, through the uh, catering systems. All of these are extremely vulnerable. Uh, today, and I think that, uh, that this we need to pay much more attention to that, and, and a little bit less, or at least uh, as much attention to that as we're paying to the carrier and uh, and what it does. And in your view, does FAA presently have regulatory authority to address these concerns? Well, FAA is a regulatory agency. We always have difficulty when we try to push a regulatory agency into roles such as intelligence collection. Uh, they have an anal analytical capability. It's good as far as it goes, but they have no collection capability. Uh, any time you push them into an operational role, you're, you're changing very substantially the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the uh, charter of that organization, and it's going to require some substantial uh, adjustments to, uh, to make an accommodation. Mr. But I, I would like to say, uh, too, this question of, of, of uh, whether we do what we do as well as other people uh, do what they do. We, th th there's a question of what is practical in this business. We fly, uh, this year, we will probably fly between one and a half and two billion people. And then you take all the luggage that, and, the, and, the, and multiply that out and see what we have to deal with. It's a much larger problem than the smaller foreign airlines have to deal with. Added to that is the fact that we have a threat because of our political position in the world that Scandinavian airlines and other smaller airlines don't have. And so I think it has to be taken into uh, consideration when we're making these calculations. We're really comparing apples and oranges, and we're leading ourselves to a conclusion that there are solutions to this thing that maybe are not as, uh, as immediately uh, 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 reachable as we're, uh, as we're being led to believe. Even El Al has had uh, great difficulties. In this business, luck, it's awfully good to have luck on your side. And uh, there are lucky airlines. Uh, El Al itself had uh, a short time ago, uh, a few years back, a, uh, a bomb on an airplane uh, that traveled all over Europe and came back home uh, that uh, uh, did not detonate because of a malfunction, but it was pure luck that, uh, that brought that about. But that's not something that's, that's generally been public knowledge. And I think that's the sort of thing that, that is an argument for making clear to the public what the, uh, what the terms of reference are that we're dealing with when we address these issues, and not to assume that there's perfection attainable when it's not. Thank you, Mr. Cook. Madam Chair, do I have any time remaining? Yes, you have. Uh, Mr. Cunningham, when I toured the Pan Am facilities in New York, uh, I was made aware that there is at least some intelligence sharing that presently occurs. For example, the airlines uh, are made aware of the names of known terrorists. Uh, the problem, of course, is that terrorists generally don't check in and buy tickets under their known terrorist names. Uh, what would you do with additional intelligence information if you had it? How could you use it? What do you have in mind that you want? Well, I, I'm talking about, of course, there are situations where, where there are names that are used or have been used in the past and derivatives that, that are used. Uh, I'm talking about information such as uh, types of passports that are floating around that these groups predominantly use. And when a piece of information comes through, for example, that a group is planning something, maybe we should know some more about the group, about the, the current people that are, uh, that are operating within it, about their current methodologies, about what kind of technology this particular group might have in order us to take whatever resources we have and put it at the point where, the, uh, where it will what be the strongest against the potential threat. In your testimony, you made reference to restraints that are placed upon Pan Am by host governments overseas. 
Uh, what are those constraints? How do they operate? Well, it varies, of course, from country to country, but some of them are that they object to the redundant screening processes we use because uh, some countries feel that it, it, makes their, it, it indicates that their screening is weak. Uh, in some places, we're not allowed to conduct background checks on, uh, on various employees. So it, it really runs a whole host of, uh, uh, of things. My time has expired. I think this is an area that we perhaps will follow up with in a subsequent round. Um, thank you. Uh, Mr. Ford, um, um, can you tell us whether or not, and I understand you're very familiar with um, some of the considerations that were made uh, and the recommendations by KPI, and are you familiar with uh, whether or not, the question is whether or not um, financial concerns were of uh, major consideration in making decisions about security at Pan Am based on uh, KPI recommendations, as they relate to KPI recommendations? I would have to assume that there were some. The, uh, as the load factor increased in the summer of 86, if, if, I think your chronology will show that the load factor was extremely low following the TWA 847 experience. That was part of the uh, incentive that caused the initiative to form ALERT. As the load factor increased through the summer of 86, although it was not anywhere near where it was the summer before, I think the sense of urgency was diminished in contrast uh, with the uh, expense that was being incurred through the implementation of the various recommendations of ALERT, of the KPI report. Mr. Cunningham, I believe in response to a question from the general lady from California, you mentioned that um, uh, your security package is put together and then is sent to budget. Has budget been very forthcoming, or do you receive the kind of financial support that you need for a good security system at Pan Am today? Yes, I think we do, Madam Chairwoman. I, I'm asked to, uh, to justify what we need, but I, but I think, yes, it's, it's a commitment there to provide the resources necessary to have an effective security program, yes. Mr. Ford, can you um, uh, address the question of whether or not there were extraordinary efforts made by ALERT at JFK and Miami during your uh, tenure? The initial uh, stations that received uh, uh, considerable attention were JFK, Washington, Dulles, Miami, Los Angeles, and San Francisco, the key international gateways of the Pan Am system as they existed in 1986. And they were implemented, the, the um, suggestions and recommendations were implemented there at those? The, well, the impl there was the KPI report, the survey being done by that group was still in process. The changes that were made on starting at JFK on June 12th of 1986 were an enhanced level of security over what existed on June 11th. And the enhancement included very basically more people, uh, increased training, and uh, increased utilization of detection devices. But again, all of these were uh, on the format of Part 107 and had, uh, were not implemented on the basis of anything that KPI was to recommend later on uh, that summer. Mr. Cunningham, you uh, mentioned in response to a question also by the gentle lady from California that uh, one of the things the government can do is to provide you with um, certain kinds of intelligence, and that has been uh, discussed a great deal. My question is, um, do you today receive some kinds, you don't have to say what kind, of intelligence today uh, from FAA? Yes. Okay. Uh, did you have some prior to Pan Am 103? Yes. Okay, and I'm not going to ask any more about that at this point in time. Um, one of the things that um, I think you mentioned in an earlier or comment is that uh, Mr. Yeffett mentioned that there should be some attitudinal changes uh, about airplane security, and he talked about a number of things and so forth. Have you seen in, uh, in Pan Am attitudinal changes about security? Since I came, yes, very since much so. you've been there, yes, very much so. Yeah, and uh, not just since Pan Am 103, but uh, since you've been there, yes, very much so. Okay, have you seen an, an, a heightening of that awareness that you talk about so much since December of 1988? Yes, absolutely. Okay, uh, 
Pan Am has served the Frankfurt market longer than any other United States carrier. And has this provided any particular benefit for Pan Am? And if so, how would you characterize your relationship with German officials? Mr. Cunningham. Well, I think being the largest carrier in Frankfurt uh, certainly is a very good position to be in, but it also has some problems. It, it means that we're, we have a, a much more visible and much more vulnerable operation than any other carrier there merely because of size. I would characterize our relations with the Germans as generally very good, but they firmly believe in their programs uh, of security uh, and sometimes have trouble with us telling them that we must do certain things there. Well, shortly after, the, after Pan Am 103, the FAA modified security requirements. And briefly, what were those changes and how did the authorities in both uh, London and Frankfurt react to those modifications? Mr. Cunningham. Well, briefly, the changes involved increased screening of both personnel uh, and luggage. Uh, and I think they, they generally accepted them. They, their concern is, is that Another government is coming abroad and telling them in their country how to do business and what infringing on what they feel as their role for safety. Uh, a problem that I have with that process is that most of it requires us to go to the German authorities and say, here's what we're being required to do. Can we do that? And if the case is that they say, no, you cannot do that, it's up to us then to go back to the FAA and say, we have this problem and here's what we're doing to comply. I have no problem changing our methods to comply and setting up an alternative system to comply. But I think that's a role of government to deal government to government and say here's why we do this, here's we need, how we need to do this, and maybe in this particular airport you can help us to do it a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. My time has expired. Mr. Nielsen. Oh, I'm sorry. Mr. No, the chairman. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Mr. Cunningham, just to be following up a little bit. Um, Statement says, other than Israel, the U.S. government is said to have the most stringent security requirements. Do you agree with that? Yes, I think that's true. Okay, now, you and Mr. Effett uh, disagreed when you said U.S. versus all other airlines. You thought the U.S. would fare very well against the total of other airlines. He, he took the opposite point of view. Uh, are there some other countries which are pretty good or is it pretty bad? Uh, yeah, I, I think the levels vary according to... Uh, according to uh, what their attitude is as well. I, I think if you go and, and aboard uh, an aircraft uh, from France, from Germany, from uh, Great Britain, uh, or from, um, from Spain, I think you'll see a, a noticeably different level of security than you will getting aboard a U.S. carrier, whether it be in the U.S. or whether it be overseas. Mr. Ford, uh, you were in charge of security at the time of the uh, uh, study that was made. How did you react to that study, and uh, how did you react to what ALERT was doing as compared to what was advertised and what actually happened? Did you make any protests that perhaps they were, ALERT was a public relations gimmick that wasn't being, wasn't really forthright? Did you, any, did you have any comments of that nature? Going back to uh, May 12th when, of 1986 when uh, ALERT was formed. Did you approve of ALERT, by the way? Oh, I thought the concept was uh, extremely uh, important to okay. restore credibility to uh, safety of travel across the Atlantic, yes. Do you think it worked? It didn't get a chance to work. Why uh, not? Well, again, I, I go back to these two schools of thought. There was a group that felt that uh, this was overly aggressive uh, beyond the parameters of Part 107. Uh, there was an internal discussion within the company as to uh, uh, the merits of 107 versus uh, the threat of gridlock uh, if the recommendations of KPI were uh, adopted. There was, to my recollection, uh, recollection, not a great deal of discussion as to which parts of the KPI report, their initial survey, uh, could be introduced without creating uh, passenger gridlock. And the uh, proponents of Part 107 uh, was what we are required to do, and that's adequate. Uh, they prevailed uh, in that argument. I'm going to ask you tomorrow, so you'll be planning ahead, as to why you're no longer security director and some of the other things. I'll ask that in this closed session. Well, but, uh, 
I will tell you that at the, let me uh, clarify it. I was the president of Alert when it was created to get the project started and to acquire the necessary technology and personnel to put it into place. Uh, there was a, another gentleman who was the actual director of security of Pan Am at that time. Uh, Mr. Kurt, this is a question you may or may not want to answer. But I'm going to try and it's a natural follow-on from your testimony, and I'm going to ask the question. State, you state in your testimony that terrorist acts fall within the framework of low-intensity conflict. If that's the case, should the United States consider ourselves technically at war with those countries which promote terrorism? Uh, yes, sir, I think we uh, it would uh, greatly simplify the response of the executive branch and the authorities in the executive branch that have to provide for the national defense if that were the case. But having said that, it doesn't seem to me to be a very practical possibility. We would first of all have to come to you folks up here and, and get your uh, concurrence with uh, what would be the practical effect of a declaration of war on these countries, which would include uh, Iran, Iraq, Syria, and Libya, at least. But I'm not sure that that's something that we can do. So we need something, some intermediate position that lets us respond to these, uh, these provocations. Uh, what would you suggest doing with these countries which harbor uh, known terrorist groups? Well, there is, there is some, some... I'm leading you a little, maybe... I know, we're, not, astray, we're looking for exotic solutions, and why don't we go bomb Damascus and things like this, but there are... No, I don't I suggest bombing any place. I'm just suggesting not, how do we handle it? I, let me suggest that in the terms, the wider terms of the debate, that's one of the things that's always suggested, Mr. Nielsen. The, uh, we have the Bonn Declaration, for example, which is a protocol agreed to by a number of nations. Uh, that provides sanctions against countries that sponsor this sort of activity or that interfere with the uh, free operation of civil aviation. Could we perhaps we, uh, deny them landing rights in our country, perhaps? Something, well, something of that nature? The, the, that, that's anticipated under the terms of the Bond Declaration, but it's, it's virtually impossible to enforce it. Okay. Why do you suppose, Mr. Kush, that people choose a foreign carrier in flying to and from this country rather than Pan Am or TWA? What are the reasons they use? Why they fly a foreign flag rather than an is American? It because of schedule advantages, or is it because they feel they're safer, or is it because they don't want the, con the inconvenience that uh, our American carriers put on them? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure three? that it's, I'm, I'm not sure that I've... Or pick another number, none of the above, if you have other one. Well, you're suggesting that people fly foreign flag for purposes of security, and I'm not sure that, there, that the numbers would show that you have a lot of people flying foreign flag uh, in, in preference to American flag carriers. Mr. Cunningham, would you like to comment on that, and uh, then I'll turn the time back. I think the answer probably would be all of the above. All of the above. In which, per in which proportion? <laughs> I, I'm not sure I can answer that, but I, I think very definitely there is, there is some concern. There is also some concern about the security procedures, but I, I think it could be a variety of other reasons as well. Marketing issues, service issues. I, I, I can't tell you a proportion. I, I really don't know, but I think all of them are, are, uh, uh, are accurate, though. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah. This is Boxer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I want to get back to this alert. Um, as I understand it, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Ford, this, this operation, this company alert, this whole new system, there were big ads about it. It was open with great fanfare. And it is my understanding from the staff research that in essence what happened is that Wackenhut uh, the former contractor uh, merely uh, sent to Pan Am employees that were there before that just had additional training, that in fact there wasn't any separate operation. They just went back to the outside contractor, gave them a few more hours of training, and, uh, and said they have this great operation. And was that an incorrect analysis I think by the staff? From a management standpoint, it's inaccurate because the management of alert was totally separate from and did not at that time include any hiring any of the Wackenhut uh, top management personnel. Uh, there was in fact uh, a large percentage 
of the Wackenhut security guards who were in place prior to the formation of ALERT, I would say there were at least 60 percent of the Wackenhut screening agents on June 11th were uh, left the employee of Wackenhut and became employees of uh, ALERT, but the supervision was entirely uh, different and so selected by So what kind of training did these people get? The uh, people received training in uh, the basics, uh, the same training that they received uh, at uh, Wackenhut. I do believe it was more intense and more detailed. You do believe? I know for a fact that it was more intense and, and uh, more detailed than they received at Wackenhut. But again... How many hours of additional training did they get before they did the same certain, job? I they believe did. it was close to uh, 40 hours. You believe it was 40 hours of additional training and so the same I cannot say for out. certain. I was not involved okay. directly with the training of the screening agents. Okay. Um, let me see. Mr. Um, I, I, I want to say your name right. Yefit. Mr. Cook says in his um, testimony, and I'm quoting, the carriers should be responsible for safety, and they are. They do it superbly. Security is a separate problem far beyond their competence, and it shows. And he goes on to say that what we need to do, and I'm quoting, the terminal operators ought to have at least as large, if not a larger, responsibility for security than the carriers. Do you agree with that? No, I disagree. I believe that the airlines must be responsible for their security. They have to get help from the government by asking them what kind of procedures we have to follow. Can somebody teach us how to build a security system if they don't know? But it's their business as they run their airlines to make sure that the flight will remain always safe and secured and not to think that somebody else has to run my security. So you feel very strongly that it's the airlines, it should be the major party responsible and that is in direct uh, I think a contradiction to Mr. Cook and, and Mr. Cunningham. I just want to say for the record, um, Mr. Ford, that uh, your comment that there was totally different management seems to be in question here between Alert and Wackenhut because Alert's current president, Ed LeBlanc, was formerly a Wackenhut executive. That's correct, but I didn't hire him. Uh, he was hired after, I believe he was hired after Pan Am 103. I'm not I'm not uh, looking to, to blame anyone. I'm just saying that currently that's the situation. The management that was hired for Alert in June of 1986 was entirely separate from Wackenhut. And it were, I'd just like to make, if I may, one additional comment on the training. Even if there were 80 hours or 40 hours or 120 hours of training, it really doesn't make much difference because the training was based on what Part 107 called for. And I think that's the essence of this argument. Part 107 is inadequate. Well, we certainly do have to look at uh, Part 107. Um, I would like to change the focus to the minimum wage issue here. And again, Mr. Cook is very, very eloquent on this. He says, put minimum wage people on a million dollar machine, give them little or no training, manage them like entry level people, and you'll get minimum wage performance out of your million dollar machine. Now, I'd like to ask Mr. Cunningham if he agrees that these people ought to be paid more? And if so, why aren't the airlines paying them more or looking for higher level people? I agree with Mr. Cook's statement. That's very definitely true. And I think if that were the attitude of the airlines back several years ago, I really don't think it is today because airlines certainly see that that's the result you're going to get. And I don't think there is any carrier out there today who is looking for the cheapest contractor uh, who will provide people, who will provide bodies to sit there. In fact, there are many discussions going on as to what you have to give these people to, uh, or what you have to give the people you're hiring to get well, what do you pay better, the better quality. Then? What do you pay it, the It varies. Person? I think it has to vary by area, but generally we, we have a package that's going to be above a minimum wage, that's going to include some benefits, and it's, uh, you know, health, uh, life insurance benefits as well, and it's going 
to include some travel benefits. Do you support our raising the minimum wage? Yes. Good. I definitely do. I'm going to quote you in, in our argument with the President on this. I would be happy will to. we have one more opportunity, or is this the very last one that I'll have? This is the last one. Can I ask for one additional minute? I yield to the gentlewoman so one additional minute. You know, I flew all night to get here, Madam Chair. I want you to know that. So therefore, I ask. The chair is being so lenient. <laughs> Chairwoman Neal, I also flew red eye to get here. Then you well, absolutely you deserve the another as well. Also. <laughs> this is good. This is uh, upping the ante. Um, let me let me ask a question to. Um, to, to anyone who feels they can answer it, because I don't know which one of you wants to answer this question. But if the State Department received a threat and reported it to its employees, do you think, and then told the airlines that the airlines have a responsibility to inform the passengers, just as the State Department personnel had an opportunity to have all the facts and make a judgment? Yes, Mr. Leff. Leff. Can I? Yes. I think it will be a mistake to publish threat. And I hope that tomorrow in the closed session, I'll have the opportunity to go on more details. To answer your question, ma'am, the fact that government employees, diplomats, or anyone else took the information and told his relatives or his friends about the information to warn them. I think it's violation, it's discrimination, and the authorities should invest investigate all those employees who received this information to find those who violated that they were dishonest by using confidential information to their close friends or relatives. Isn't it a pretty human thing to do? No. It oh, depends. Please. Excuse me. It okay. depends. It depends on what we are talking. If it's human being to do, why the airlines they don't have the right to publish it. Why everybody doesn't have the right to publish it? Because it's a human being attitude. We are talking about security, we are talking about life. And we cannot mix emotion with security. We have to be careful not to mix emotion with security and to let the security remain confidential and let the right people who are in charge for the security to take the right steps and to be ready to surprise the terrorists and not to let the terrorists surprising us. The time of the gentleman Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Madam Chairman, yes. I'd like to follow up on the attack that was taken there. I know Mr. Campbell has some questions. Uh, but since you don't think it should be published, you don't think any one group should have knowledge that they can use their exclusive benefit, what steps should the airline take knowing that they were warned in plenty of time, they were warned about a lady from Helsinki who was going to come to Frankfurt and then thence to the United States. Uh, what could they have done that they didn't do? On a regular, basic, security that airline is running their flights. If they won't build their security to be able to stop terrorists or criminals on the ground the moment they come to attack us or to send explosives into the aircraft, they know they don't have any right to exist even. Because why we need them? 99.9. That's my specific question, though. What could they have done that they did not do, with given this information? Well, I would. I think we will uh, discuss it tomorrow uh, in the closed session. But in general, I can say that 99.9 .9 of the passengers 
are not criminals and are not terrorists. Our problem is, while we don't have information, so we have to build our security system to look for the one that is coming to attack us. That's why we are checking all the 100% of the passengers. If we cannot, on a regular basis, to give the answer, I don't think that we have the right to say even that we are the security of this airline and we in charge to, make, to, to secure the flights. I look for, uh, forward to some further elaboration on that point tomorrow. I'll yield back the balance of my time. Mr. Cox. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I'd like to get back to Mr. Cook, if I might. I was impressed that your testimony highlighted the fact that our civil aviation system simply isn't ready for what's become of it in the realm of terrorism. Keeping in mind that the entire notion of terrorist attacks embodies a randomness. Terrorists have attacked discotheques. Terrorists have attacked, obviously, airplanes. They've attacked Olymp Olympic villages. Uh, there's no telling what generally unprotected site they might attack next, but they have fixated upon airlines. So we've got now to take a system not designed for war and deal with it in that context. And recognizing this, you have described the terrorist attacks on civil aviation as low intensity conflict in uh, Pentagon analysis. And you've said as a subsidiary point that that means we ought to use the military in dealing with terrorist attacks on civil aviation. Do you want to elaborate on that? I, I, I don't have that uh, in front of me, Mr. Cox, but what I, what I said in there was if it means that we should use the military in certain instances, then indeed we ought to. Uh, that does not mean in, uh, to use them in force options, although that may be uh, useful for some deterrent consequences. But we have uh, a fair amount of capability within uh, the military services, particularly with those people who deal with terrorism, to function uh, on, a, on an emergency basis in airports where uh, we know that there's a very high threat level and uh, we can use those kinds of capabilities. That, that would be one option that we might choose to use. But you see, you're moving into very, very dangerous areas here because you're, you're suddenly taking uh, capabilities that are designed for, uh, to defend a country in war or in uh, extreme circumstances in a hostage incident or something of this nature and, using, and making screeners out of them, in effect. And yet that expertise does rest there. And uh, in certain circumstances, we might find that it's useful to resort to it. But I think there are a number of other areas that we can turn to before that for, uh, for, uh, for assistance before we would have to use the military. Thank you. Mr. Cunningham, uh, getting back to the problems that we have overseas with governments uh, operating uh, airports and airlines, uh, uh, the latter, by the way, competitive in some cases with uh, our own uh, airlines. What problems specifically are we running into when we, America, try to implement our own security procedures in somebody else's airport? The biggest problem we as the carrier face is that we're conveying to them, to the foreign government, the impression that we don't think their program is adequate, that we know better. Uh, and the reaction we generally get back is, well, you run your airline and we'll be responsible for the safety of our citizens in our country and don't tell us how to do it. Uh, they feel that we're showing them up and that we're... Do you want to name some countries where this is occurring? Well, I, I think it occurs a number of places on different bases. You know, sometimes it's, it's merely that we can't conduct a search uh, of a bag. Sometimes it's we can't conduct a background check, as I said. Does this occur in Frankfurt? On occasion, yes. Yes. Now, is it possible that uh, the United States might negotiate... Uh, uh, treaties or protocols with foreign governments to tighten this up? Yes, very definitely. I, I and if we were to do that, what specifically ought we to seek in those negotiations? We ought to see that we're all on the same, same wavelength. We all agree on what the procedures that need to be done, a minimum state, uh, and that we can go beyond that, but that the procedures will be implemented uh, as much as possible. In Germany, do they do redundant searches? In some places, yes. 
In the Frankfurt Airport? In Frankfurt, we do them, and, and occasionally. Not you, not you, but say Lufthansa. No. All right. No. Oh, I'm sorry. I misunderstood your question, Mr. Gerst. No, no, no carrier other than a U.S. carrier does redundant searches. Now, how do we get them to accept our notion that that's important? I, I don't know, quite honestly. I, I think that's a function that has to be dealt with on a government-to-government -government basis. I wonder, before my time runs out, if I might ask Mr. Yeffett to respond to that. Uh, how can we get governments uh, that, for example, don't accept the need for redundant screening to do so? From my experience, sir, I don't think that we would face any problems to get the permission from the local authorities in each country to search any luggage we want or... No, no, no I'm, that's, a, that's a different... I'm not talking about how we get permission to do it ourselves. How do we get them to do it so that uh, when we're competing against a government-owned airline, uh, they can't get their passengers through faster? Do you mean that they will do it for us? No, I mean that we want uniform security requirements for all airlines out of a terminal. How do we get a, f a host government uh, to agree that our more stringent procedures are necessary for their airlines as well? I think we can talk with any uh, government about what we need for our American carriers. I don't think that we can tell them in their country what we want them to do when it has nothing to do with our flights and our passengers. So we're left at that competitive disadvantage then? They can do whatever they want. We are responsible for our flights, for our passengers, for our cargo, for our catering, and so on and so on. If we will come to the local authorities and we will ask them an assistant to uh, solve our problems while we cannot do everything by ourselves, for example, for example if we need to protect a concentration uh, uh, around the checking counter, when we have... I'm going to have to interrupt just because my time's running out, but uh, I want to point out that American travelers, uh, yours truly included, uh, oftentimes fly on foreign flag carriers. And so in protecting American citizens, I think we ought to focus not only on what American carriers are doing in these foreign terminals, but also what the foreign carriers are doing. Uh, uh, Mr. Ford, do you have any thoughts on this subject? I think this is some another... I'm sorry, Mr. Mr. Oh, Ford? Sorry. I think it's, uh, if it's done in a manner that is not uh, interpreted as showing up the foreign government, that it is entirely achievable. It will be more difficult in certain countries than it is in others, but I think it's, uh, as Mr. Cunningham pointed out, but I do think it's achievable. Uh, Mr. Cunningham? Mr. Gex, I'd just like to add, I really think the only way to do that is by the regulatory process here in the United States. And you tell a foreign carrier, a foreign government, that if our citizens are flying your carrier to our country, these are the rules you will follow, period. I think and, that's the only way to Mr. Yeffet, you agree with that? Yeah. I yield back. Thank you. Um, there was some discussion. There was some earlier discussion about the um, Section 107 and uh, Part 107. I wanted to point out that, uh, just for the record, that uh, Part 107 deals with airport security, whereas 108 deals with uh, security measures to be taken by the air carrier. And I hope that we'll keep those things in mind as we progress with this hearing. I thank all of the panelists for um, coming before us. Uh, at this particular time. We thank you for your testimony. Again, your full testimonies will be made a part of the record. Thank you. Our next panel will be Mr. Ray Zalazar, who's the Director of the Office of Civil Aviation Security, and Mr. Monte Belger, who's the Associate Administrator for Aviation Security, both for FAA. We'll have those two gentlemen come forward at this time, please. We're going to split it up because um, they wanted to, uh, they don't want to go on the door. Yeah. We're going to break, uh, after, after, after they get you, get you with them, we're going to break them off for lunch. Good. Yeah, before they leave.
I'm just going to have just these two now.